So quick introduction, my name is Jeff Hunter with VMware, just like the slide says there. I'm a senior systems engineer with VMware with a specialty focus on business continuity and disaster recovery. I've been with VMware about four and a half years. Uh, prior to that, I was a customer of VMware, so I've been in many of your shoes, I, I suspect. Uh, so it's, it's nice to be able to have both perspectives under my belt here. Obviously, the title of the slide here, VMware Data Recovery, uh, everything you need to know. I'm not sure it's every single thing, but hopefully we're going to cover a good portion of that. Obviously, we'll take questions after the fact, especially considering we've got a smaller audience here. Uh, so we, we should have plenty of time for questions because there is no, no session after this one. So don't be afraid to either speak up during the session if you want to, or if you want to hold your question until afterwards, I will certainly stick around for that as well. Uh, we're going to focus on uh, VMware Data Recovery, which is a, a backup product that VMware uh, introduced with vSphere 4. Uh, so we have the, v, uh, the VMware uh, uh, vStorage APIs for data protection. That's a mouthful, so I'm going to refer to that as VADP going forward, a set of APIs that we developed, and then we turned around and built this solution on top of that. So that's what we're going to dig into. Uh, disclaimer, I, I'm guessing uh, by this time you have seen this slide maybe once or twice, so I'm not going to spend any time there. Uh, again, here's some of the topics we're going we're gonna to take a look at, right? So kind of set the stage a little bit. Um, I think it's important to understand, just like the little colored circle show down here, that uh, the business continuity is, is not just disaster recovery. It's not just backup and restore. It's not just high availability, right? And, and I know that seems like 101 stuff, but you would be surprised uh, in how many conversations I've been in with customers, partners, and whatnot where they're like, yeah, our DR plan, and in the next sentence they'll say, yeah, our business continuity plan, and they use those terms interchangeably. Uh, in my opinion, business continuity from an IT perspective consists of all three of these items. VMware data recovery, of course, is focused on the green bubble there, right? So the data protection part of that. That's great if we have a highly available server, right? That's, that's great if we have a, a, an excellent disaster recovery plan, uh, but if we don't protect our data, then all of that other stuff makes no sense at all. So uh, we want to make sure that we cover all three of those. So, so some of the things we'll look at is, is number one, what is VDR, right? What, what, what is it comprised of? How does it work? How do you install it, configure it? And, and of course, what's new in VDR 2.0? I'm not sure if you knew this or not, but with the release of vSphere 5, with all the new features, some 200 and some, or whatever the count is on that, uh, that were released, uh, this, this tend to got lost in the details a little bit. But we did improve uh, VMware data recovery a little bit. Most of it is actually underneath the covers, so there's very few cosmetic improvements on the outside, like fancy new bells and whistles and that sort of thing. There are a couple, which we'll certainly touch on. And then, of course, probably the best part of the session, at least hopefully anyway, is going to be maybe some guidelines, best practices, things to think about, if nothing else, and we'll certainly dig into those as well. So let's talk about the, uh, the whole, like I mentioned just a moment ago, the data protection is part of business continuity, right? Um, again, it's, it's a facet that, that is included with disaster recovery and high availability because data is king. Again, our business is not based on, on our, our servers or our storage or our network. It's based on the data that all of those things support, right? Uh, we need to have that protection against disasters, whether it's natural or man-made. And believe it or not, way more often than not, when a disaster occurs in, in any shape or form, it's, it's more often than not caused by a man-made issue, right? Somebody accidentally hit the delete button, or when they did a restore, they, they copied over top of that production uh, data or whatever the case might be. So we need to make sure we have a plan around that. More importantly, why we have that plan is to, to save us from, uh, from the damages that occur when we have downtime. You know, for example, the money that is lost, right? That could be hundreds of dollars, a few hundred bucks or whatever. It could be millions of dollars. I I've asked this in the previous two sessions. Uh, I've got a high dollar amount so far, but uh, out of the folks here, has anybody um, actually just, you know, taken a, a bit of time and figured out exactly what, what downtime does cost their organization? Anyone? Hands in the audience? We only had a few in the last session. There there's a gentleman way in the back. If you can yell a little bit and tell us what your cost of downtime is per hour. I'm, I'm sorry, you said about $2 million per hour or per day? Okay, so big number, right? I think the, the I, I'm not going to do the math on that real quick, but I think the other number I heard that was pretty sizable too is about 300000 bucks an hour. Uh, so you're, you're probably right in that, in that area as well, right, doing some quick math on that. But um, yeah, that's, that's a huge amount of money. So recovery time is, is critical when you're, when you're looking at dollar amounts like that, right? Those, those could certainly be resume, resume generating opportunities uh, if you don't have a good plan to restore quickly. So uh, that's a key piece there. 
Another reason that we need to look at backups and, and so forth is because we're mandated to in some cases, right? Uh, compliance, whether it's PCI, HIPAA, or, or maybe European Union, or whatever the case might be, like it shows up on the slide there, uh, as more and more of these, these compliance uh, um, mandates come out, uh, that, that is becoming a, a core part of that, right? To, to demonstrate that we have the ability to recover from disasters in, in any shape or form out there. So that's another very good reason. And then last but not least, sort of unrelated, but it still is related, is I put up there that replication is not enough. And the reason I say that is you would be surprised how many organizations I've gone into and I, I asked them, you know, you know, what are you guys doing to back up your, your virtual machines today, right? Oh, we're replicating to the, you know, to the other site, so we're good. And I'm like, okay, so let me get this straight. If you have data corruption in your primary virtual machine and you're replicating that to the other site, I think we can all do the math there, right? We're going to have bad data across the wire. So you need, you need both, right? Replication in and of itself is, is not data protection. You could, you could potentially replicate a, a bad problem there. So, so the solution, uh, you know, we have one. There's obviously other solutions out there. Ours is VMware Data Recovery. Again, this is included with vSphere in all of the versions except for Essentials. So uh, if you have a standard license or enterprise, or maybe you're still on vSphere 4, which probably most of us are since 5 is so new, uh, Advanced has it as well, uh, you have uh, VMware Data Recovery in your arsenal already. You just need to simply deploy it. Maybe some of you have already. So that's, that's kind of my next question. Is anybody in the audience already using BDR? So a handful of folks, right? And, and I'm guessing, and I'm guessing there are probably mixed reviews on this product as well. Um, I've heard there have been pain points around the 1.x. I, I believe in complete transparency here, so I'm not going to stand up here and tell you that it has been the perfect product up to this point. But what I am here to tell you is 2.0 is certainly a lot better, so we've got some improvements here that we'll talk about shortly. So stay tuned on that one. So what is VDR for folks that are not using VDR today? And for a little review for those folks that are. Uh, not that you need it, right? It's, it's literally just a, uh, an appliance that is deployed out into your virtual infrastructure, and then there is a vSphere client plugin uh, that goes along with that as well. And that's it. That's how simple it is to get up and running with, with VDR. Again, you already have the license for it. If you have vSphere, you simply deploy this appliance, plug that, uh, that plugin into your vSphere client, and at that point, you'll see here shortly how easy it is to start creating backup jobs, how to do restores, and, and some other items as well. Um, the nice thing about VDR is it's agentless, so we don't have to deploy agents inside of the virtual machines, okay? And it is disk-based only. So I've had the question, uh, can I do backups to tape with this particular tool? And the answer is no, you cannot directly. However, there may be a need to archive, right, some of this data that you're backing up with the tool. And we'll talk about that a little bit later in the presentation as well, if there is a need for something like that. The other nice thing is backups occur regardless of the power state of the virtual machine. Right? And that is not always the case with other solutions out there, especially if you have agents installed inside of the VM. If the VM's not on, there's nothing for uh, that backup server to talk to from an agent standpoint. So the good news with VDR is we don't care if it's on or off, we'll back it up just the same. Uh, we can do full virtual machine restores, so we can grab the whole image. We're talking about the VMX file, the, the NVRAM file, and of course the, the important stuff, the, the VMDK files. Or if you want to, we can, we can actually mount those from the, the backup uh, destination data store and pull individual files out of those as well with what we call file level restore tools. So uh, I'll show you a little bit about that as well. Uh, data deduplication. That is also built into the product too. I actually have a screenshot that gives you at least a little sampling of how efficient that deduplication is. Uh, it's very good, very good. So uh, we'll talk about that in a bit. And then last but not least, I'm all about keeping it simple, right? That, that's been my motto for, for many years now is let's just, let's just make it easy unless there's a real good reason to make it more complex. And that is what I really like about this tool. It's easy to deploy, it's easy to configure, and it's easy to work with, right? It's all wizard-based, it's GUI-based, uh, a very simple tool, and, and again, that is the beauty of the product. So what's new in VDR 2.0? As I mentioned, there are not a, a lot of new bells and whistles, really. The, probably the biggest one that you'll notice out of the gate is we have the ability now to send out email reports. Uh, so that's something we lacked in, in VDR 1.x. Uh, we now have the ability to, to specify an email address, so that way every time your backups run, uh, I can get a, a report at you know, 7 a.m. every weekday or whatever the case might be. Uh, you also have the option to suspend and resume backup jobs on an individual basis. So if there's a certain backup job, maybe it's the end of the month accounting and you want to make sure that nothing at all is touching those accounting servers. So we're going to suspend backups on those for a day or two while that big processing goes on. Uh, you can certainly suspend that if that's what the business calls for, right? So you have the option to do that as well. 
Previously in VDR 1.0, uh, there were maintenance jobs that would run on that appliance and you really had no easy way to control or schedule those. We've added a, a maintenance window. Uh, there, there's already backup windows that you can do, but now we have a maintenance window as well. So you can kind of control that a little bit better uh, with this particular appliance. Performance has also been improved. Um, you're you're going to find that like integrity checks, again, for those folks that are currently using BDR, you're going to find that those are a little bit uh, faster and compression speed as well has improved. There's the, again, there's been a lot of stuff done underneath the covers with VDR that may not be evident on the surface there, but again, net result is, is this product is, is going to be a little more stable, a little faster, a little easier to work with, right? It's, it's built on a 64-bit OS now. It used to be a 32-bit, so we've made uh, improvements across the board there. You'll also notice better resiliency if you're using SIF shares, for example. Um, I don't recommend that configuration unless that's what you need to go with, uh, but if, if you do need to use SIF shares as your backup target, you'll notice that we've improved the resiliency from maybe a network interruption to that share, for example. Uh, in the past, uh, VDR would get upset when it would lose connection with the SIF share temporarily and just kind of throw its hands up in the air and say, I, I can't do this, right? And, and now we have a little more resiliency to that type of scenario. Last but not least, swap files are no longer included. Should have been there from day one, but hey, better late than never, right? So we're not backing up those useless files anymore. So key components, again, if you haven't used VDR or seen it before, again, there's an appliance there. It's an OBF. It's a Linux appliance. CentOS, OS, I believe, is the, uh, is the uh, operating system that we're using there. When we do a backup with that particular appliance, right, the first backup, of course, is going to be full. We have to get that initial full copy out there. But then after that, it's incremental forever. So in other words, we're going to utilize a, a, a tool or a, a feature, if you will, a vSphere called changed block tracking. And what that does is that understands what blocks, not files, but blocks have changed for that particular virtual machine, and then we're only going to back up those particular blocks. So for example, you might back up your virtual machine the first time. It may take roughly 20 or 30 minutes, depending on how big the VM, how fast everything is, all of that stuff, right? But then going forward, especially if it's a, a relatively static VM, it might only take two minutes to back it up going forward, right? Just the changes, in other words, for that particular virtual machine. So uh, again, very efficient there, minimal impact. Uh, VSS is supported to some level with data recovery. Uh, it's not supported completely down into like as deep as we'd like to go into the application. For example, trunking logs and exchange, right? When we do a VSS uh, uh, level backup there. So it will do some of that. I'll show you a few screenshots as evidence around that, but again, it's not true all the way deep to the core application quiesing, although that's something we're working on uh, as we move forward here with uh, VMware tools, because that's where the VSS components are for this, and also as we continue to develop the, the infrastructure itself in general. Destinations uh, for your uh, uh, data store can be uh, VMFS, right? Uh, it can be NFS, although the way that looks is you actually create a VMDK file right on, on that NFS and then present that to your appliance. In other words, you won't be able to present an NFS share directly to the appliance. It's still a VMDK, but you can put that VMDK on an NFS uh, uh, volume that's mounted by the ESX host, right, or the ESXi host. Uh, again, those data stores already duplicated, and last but not least uh, on the slide there in the bottom uh, right-hand corner, uh, a couple things to note that are important is, is vMotion and HA are supported with this. So if for some reason you've got a virtual machine bouncing around or an HA event, uh, data recovery understands that and, and will adjust accordingly. So it is aware of some of those features in the stack. Uh, quick notes uh, here on installation and configuration. It's an ISO that you download from the website, of course. So again, depending on your licensing level, you'll have the ability to download that. It is a separate download link. So you'll pull vSphere down and maybe a few other things along with that, and then you'll also find the data recovery uh, ISO image that you'll pull down. That ISO image contains everything that you need, though. It has, of course, the OVF, which is the appliance in there, and it also has the plug-in for your, your vSphere client. And then last but not least, it also has the tools, the executables, if you will, for doing file level restore for both Linux and Windows machines. So if you want to do, uh, again, file level with, with either of those platforms, you have the ability to do that uh, with this tool here. A couple other things I'll point out. Again, the guest OS is a 64-bit uh, CentOS OS uh, platform. Uh, you'll notice that it is deployed by default with two virtual CPUs and two gig of RAM, okay? So I would stick with the defaults on that. I can't uh, think of any reason to go less than or more than that. Uh, but again, that's not that big a footprint this day and age, so it's a fairly small appliance. I think about five gig on disk or something like that. Here's a quick screenshot of, uh, of, of, again, deploying that OVF. If you've never done that before, it's, it's a quick wizard that you roll through. One thing to, to note 
is that uh, when you go to deploy this appliance, make sure you choose the data store with the largest block size. That's just going to ensure compatibility across the infrastructure if you have varying block sizes uh, for your VMFS partitions. Once we've done that, then we, we turn around and add a, a backup destination to that, uh, that appliance, right? And you can add either one or two. It supports a max of two, and you'll see the, uh, the sizes up there uh, on the screen there, so a terabyte for uh, uh, VMF, or I'm sorry, VMDK or RDM. And if you're doing SIFs, uh, you're going to want to stick with something a little bit smaller, right? So about 500 gig is what you want to go max size. Um, you, you can certainly size it a little bit bigger than that, um, not supported, and you'll probably run into performance issues, so try to stay within those boundaries there. Also note that there is a minimum of uh, 10 gig, but actually we recommend at least 50 gig. So if you need to deploy just a small, maybe it's a remote office, branch office type of setup, and you only have a couple of VMs, you may be thinking you only need 20 or 30, you should still put at least 50 out there, just because there is a little overhead and extra space that is needed whenever we run some of those maintenance jobs out there. So again, 50 gig is what I recommend, absolute minimum of 10. Best practice, use a thick, thick, with a CK, thickly provisioned disk, right, not thin. Um, when it goes to grow a thinly provisioned disk, there, there may be a few hiccups there, uh, just a slight hit in performance. So uh, I, I would just go ahead and thickly provision that disk if I were you. Once we have the, uh, the VDR appliance uh, powered on, uh, if you actually look at the console, you'll see a, a screen kind of similar to that middle, middle one there. Of course, I've, I've cut some of the screen off, but very few options to, to work with. Uh, one thing to point out is make sure that you do power on, the, at least initially, that first time you power it on, power on the VDR appliance from vCenter. And the reason for that is, believe it or not, there's a back-end hook there that it grabs time zone information uh, because you will run into uh, variable results, too, if the time zone in your VDR appliance does not match the rest of your environment, right? So your vCenter server, in other, in other words. So again, the first time you power that on, do it from vCenter. Uh, that way we make sure time zone information is good. Put a, put a static IP address in there. Um, and also make sure that DNS, as always, right, any VMware environment, I think we all know by now that DNS is critical, and this is no exception, right? Make sure you've got DNS set up properly, host name, all that stuff. And, and, and by the way, the, the default password in there, I went ahead and put that in the, the presentation because, uh, believe it or not, I get asked about that quite a bit. They, they go to deploy the appliance, and I'll get an email message. Somebody's working on it in their, their lab or whatever, and like, what the heck is the root password? It, you know, you, you don't necessarily find it real easy. So it's, it's pretty simple. Uh, VMware lowercase with the at sign for the A. So I put it in the presentation as well. There's also a web interface uh, to the appliance. Uh, so that way we can do basic things like look at network settings, version numbers, uh, reboot the appliance if necessary. So you don't necessarily have to log into the console pr probably ever unless maybe there's some, uh, maybe you want to gather logs or something along that line. Take a look at those types of things. But if you want, you can do simple management tasks from the, uh, from the uh, web interface there. There is a port number. 5480 that needs to be tacked on the end of the URL. And again, I put that up there because I've seen many times where somebody would plug in just the general URL. And of course, out of the gate, the browser is going to go to port 80 and they're going to be like, it's not working. I'm like, did you put 5480 on the end of it? Oh, that fixed it. Thank you. So I went ahead and made sure we knew that up there as well. That port cannot be changed, by the way. Uh, so if that creates a firewall issue for you, uh, we're going to have to think about that, right? There's no way to, to modify that at this point. Uh, at that point, you utilize the plugin. Again, it's real simple, just like any of the other plugins that we have there. When you click on that, then you'll see a, a screen similar to the, to the one shown there toward the bottom, various information and tabs there that you can use to configure, set up backup jobs, do restores, gather reports, and, and, and whatnot. Again, pretty cut and dry, simple, easy. I, I like it. It's the beauty of it. Then we start uh, with, a, with a wizard, right, getting started. And a couple of quick configuration items, so vCenter credentials. Plug those in there so that way they can talk amongst themselves there, vCenter and the appliance. And then we also add backup destinations uh, to, that, to that appliance as well. And as I mentioned, you can do either one or two, up to two is supported. Notice by default when you initially add a, a backup destination underneath the status column, hopefully you guys can see that toward the back there, uh, it does by default uh, get added as unmounted. And you will, be, you will not be able to use that backup destination until you manually go in and mount that that particular uh, destination there, which is easy to do with the, the mount uh, link right in the upper uh, right-hand corner there. Uh, so once we do that, then we get a confirmation screen, and that's pretty much all there is to it to get that appliance set up and running. As you can see, once again, pretty darn easy. Now, for those folks that are using VDR today, there is an upgrade path that you need to be aware of. Uh, number one, always read the documentation. 
again, I know that's 101 stuff. You'll find a, a specific uh, upgrade instruction path on the release notes in this particular case. And of course, as we release new appliances, we may potentially update those release notes. So again, I know we all know this already, but you'd be amazed how many questions I get around things that are in the release notes. So make sure you read that stuff ahead of time. I added a couple of things here that I think are, are really best practices, and, and, and that is like step number one, for example. Um, I would go ahead and perform an integrity check before you do the upgrade. Uh, just to make sure everything looks good, it, it's all kosher, uh, go ahead and do that. You'll close the vSphere client at that point, get rid of the old plugin, install the new plugin, and then make sure, again, with no operations running, whether it's maintenance, backups, restores, or whatever the case might be, uh, that you unmount those destinations. So that way we, we in, a, in essence, quiesce that, that destination data store. There's nothing going on there. At that point, we're ready to get rid of the old appliance, but make sure you do not, do not delete from disk. Because as you know, when you delete from disk, it takes the VMDK files with it. It will delete those. And if we uh, delete the, the destination data stores, then all of our backups at that point are gone. We have to start over from scratch, right? Uh, as a footnote, everything that is needed to, to restore an appliance is contained in that destination data store. So not only does it store the data that we're backing up, but it also has configuration information around VDR itself. So in other words, VDR, the appliance, is pretty much a stateless uh, item, if you will. In other words, if, if something goes wrong or that, that appliance is ac accidentally deleted or, or whatever the case might be, we can simply deploy a new appliance, point it to that destination data store, and it will have the ability to, to grab the configuration off of that destination data store and pick up right where we left off with the old appliance then. So make sure you do not delete from disk. We want to keep that destination data store around. Uh, deploy the new appliance, uh, add the original destinations back in there. You'll go through the wizard once again. Uh, don't format for all the same reasons we just talked about. We want to keep that information. You'll be prompted to restore configuration. Of course, we answer yes there, and then to wrap things up again. I don't know, I don't think this is in the, doc in the documentation, but again, I recommend an integrity check after the fact as well. Again, just to make sure that we start off on the right foot there. At this point, we're ready to create a backup job. So we click on the backup tab, we click new, and quick best practice here. Again, this is, this is pretty straightforward stuff, but I did want to point out the best practice. I'll give it a descriptive name. Uh, that way, when folks are looking at logs or reports or anything like that, they know what they're looking at, right? It seems very simple, but you don't want something cryptic in there like this is backup job BR459 because people are going to be like, what, what does that mean? In, in my case here, I've got, this is my marketing department. I'm backing up all my marketing VMs. So that way, when crisis does strike, we're not trying to translate what the heck those cryptic names are, right? We know that that's the marketing department. You can add virtual machines in there uh, one at a time if you want to. So you can pick and choose individual VMs that you want to back up as part of that job. Uh, there are also various containers that you can use as well. So for example, at the data center level, uh, depending on how many VMs you have out there, you could just say, I want to back up my whole data center of, of 24 VMs or whatever that number is. Uh, also by uh, resource pool as well or by cluster. So you have some options there. And the good news is, is when you add additional VMs into that container, they will automatically be added to that backup job as well. You can also get very granular. Maybe there are certain virtual machines where you don't necessarily need maybe the C drive, which is one VMDK file, but you might want to back up the D drive, which is a separate VMDK file. You can specify just that one VMDK file if you want to. So you can also get very granular with this as well. At this point, then, uh, through the wizard, we define the, the backup window. And it's, it's again, simple. We, we simply click on the blocks when it's OK to do that backup. As you can see, the, the ones in gray, we don't run backups there through the middle of the day, for example. And then, of course, when, it, when it's blue, it's OK to run our backup jobs at that point. Again, straightforward. You can even click on the links, like if you want to enable an entire hour or disable an entire hour there, you can do that as well instead of clicking individual blocks there. Um, if you get really bored, you can make things in the scheduler window. I'm from Columbus, Ohio, so go Bucks. <laughs> we also set the retention policy here. Uh, not too many options. You can do few, more, many, or of course you can do some customization there as well. But again, like I've mentioned many times already, it's simple. That's what I like about it. Okay. Once you have your, your backup job running, depending on whether you are already in the maintenance window or not, so maybe you're working late and it's after five or six and your maintenance window, or not maintenance window, backup window is open, uh, at that point, if, if you've configured that job there to, to back up at that point, it, it will kick off right away. So something to be aware of, right? If, you're, if your backup window is open, you configure that job and you have VMs in there, they will automatically start kicking off without any warning. 
And in some cases, that might be undesirable. So again, just something to keep in mind there. Uh, you also have the option if your backup window is closed, but you want to go ahead and get that first backup out of the way right away because it's pretty non-disruptive. We use the snapshotting technology in, in, the, uh, in the vSphere infrastructure, right, uh, in order, order to be able to backup virtual machines, potentially why they're in use, not a big issue there. Uh, so if you want to go ahead and kick your backups uh, off, you can certainly do that. You can do all sources, which is everything uh, in that backup job, regardless of whether it's been backed up in the past 24 hours or not. Or you can do just the, the out-of-date uh, sources there, which means all the VMs that have not been backed up in the 24 hours. So, so a couple of options there if you want to go ahead and kick that off right away. When you go to do restores, uh, again, very similar interface-wise. You, you can pick and choose individual VMDK files. You can, you can pick VMs. Or, of course, you can pick entire containers as well. And then when you expand those out, you, you will probably have multiple restore points, again, depending on your retention policy and, of course, how many backups that have ran already. Uh, in this particular case, my, my retention policy, I haven't hit that yet. I've only done five backups, so those, those are my five options there to choose from. Uh, you, you can pick which, uh, whichever one you want to go with. And then you, you continue through the wizard there, and you have additional options as well. For example, maybe you don't want to restore to the same data store. You can pick a different data store, even a different virtual disk node if you want to. If there are things you want to change at that level, you can rename the virtual machine. Uh, you also have the option to restore the configuration, right? So the VMX and, and everything that makes up that virtual machine. Uh, whether the NIC is connected or not connected. In some cases, we want to get it connected and powered on right away if that's gone, or if we're just testing our restore there, maybe we want to bring it on disconnected, right? And of course, whether the VM is, is powered on automatically after the restore or not powered on. Again, options that you have with this tool. Speaking of doing um, um, restores, right? Uh, it, at the end of the day, that's kind of what separates the, the men from the boys, if you will, and no offense to the ladies out there, but anybody can do a backup, right? It's the pros that can do the restores. And, by, and, and, and really, the, the confidence in doing restores comes from practicing that restore, right? So we've included a feature in, in VDR here that is called Restore Rehearsal from Last Backup. And, and it's pretty easy to figure out exactly what's going on here. We're taking the last good backup of that VM, and, and we're doing a restore, a test restore, if you will, disconnected from the network, just to make sure that, hey, my backups are working. How do I know that? Because I just did a restore rehearsal, and it worked. So we're good there. We know we're getting good backups. How about file level restore? So let's talk about that for a moment. Again, as I mentioned earlier, there are, are Windows and Linux uh, clients located on that ISO. You simply copy that executable over onto whatever machine you're using at that point in time, uh, open that executable up there, and, you, and in this case, I'm showing, of course, the Windows interface there, connect to the appliance. And then what happens here behind the scenes then is we have the opportunity to browse to the various restore points, and then we can mount that particular restore point and have visibility inside of that VMDK file. But again, keep in mind, this is all inside of a, a Windows interface. So all the usual things that we're used to in using Windows, such as copy and paste, are available to us, right? So I can, I can literally find the particular file that, that I need to restore or folder or whatever the case might be, right click on it, copy it from my restore mount point, which is, by the way, it shows the name and, and date and time up there in the restore point so you know what you're copying from, and then turn around and go onto my, my real C drive, right? Not, not the one I'm mounted to, but of course the other C drive on my machine, and paste that file in there to restore that. That's too darn simple, right? So here's something crazy, and some folks are going to shudder when I say this, but this is almost easy enough to let end users do their own file restores. Ooh, scary, right? Okay, maybe not. <laughs> Just something to think about, though. We made it pretty darn easy. How about Linux? Uh, there is the option to do file level restore in Linux as well. Uh, there are actually two, uh, two scripts in there, if you will. So one starts with a lowercase v, the other an uppercase v. Make sure you use the uppercase v because it's actually a, a wrapper around that lowercase v script with some additional items in there. Uh, I don't know all the, the itty bitty details of that, but what I've been told is make sure you use the uppercase v. Also, a couple things. Uh, make sure that you have uh, a fuser installed as well. Uh, in, in my particular case, I was using an Ubuntu machine here, uh, 804 long, uh, long term support. And uh, it, it come back with that error message. Well, the good news is, is uh, the, the, the VMware knowledge base had the solution. And, and I don't know how many times I've done this, and maybe you've done it too, but uh, don't forget about the knowledge base in the forums, right? Uh, of course, if you're running into real issues, you, you definitely want to call VMware support, but uh, it makes sense to check those sources as well. In this particular case here, you can see that uh, KB Article 103.5231 had the fix. I was up and running, ready to go within a few minutes there. Same thing with Windows, the, uh, the root mount point is going to be the, the, the date and time of that particular restore point there.
then we can, of course, we can copy and paste at that point. Uh, there's also an advanced mode, so if you want to mount multiple restore points or multiple VMs, you can check the box down there and have a, a, a different interface there uh, for, for the advanced uh, users out there who, who do lots of restores. And then uh, here, let's get to the new stuff, right? So, so how about email reports? I mentioned this one earlier. Pretty darn easy to configure. Again, we just put our, our SMTP server in there, some, some credentials. Um, who it's coming from and of course uh, who it's going to. You can specify up to 10 uh, addresses in that, in that blank down there. And then of course a schedule. What time of the day do you want it and what days of the week do you want it? So you get a nice little report that looks something like this right here. Again, my apologies to the folks in the back. There was no easy way to take a screenshot of this. It's pretty small print. So I put those blue bubbles up there to at least uh, highlight the information contained within that report. So it shows you the appliance, uh, the specific appliance name, in other words, what version it is. Uh, also talks about uh, what backup jobs are there, the destination. Gives you some details around the destination. So your total capacity, in this particular case, uh, I have 99.8 gig total capacity there, roughly 100 if you round it up. Uh, I'm only using 6.5 gig and, and, and the status of that destination is it's ready. So it's, it's ready to, uh, to accept those backups. Uh, it also shows the virtual machines that I successfully backed up. So it's backup job, uh, my marketing department has my marketing VM in there. And in this case, it took eight minutes and 56 seconds. So it has lots of nice details what I'm getting at. Last but not least, at the end of the uh, report there, you will see warnings and errors as well. So if you have issues, you will now be able to see those without having to go and manually check. You'll have this report in your inbox. Uh, in this particular case here, I don't have a UPS system attached to my, uh, to my lab, uh, so I lost power at one point while this backup was taking place, and that's what it says. It says task terminated unexpectedly, possibly due to a power failure or system crash, which was exactly what it was. So we get a nice descriptive error message there. I talked about maintenance windows uh, uh, just a little bit earlier. Before VDR 2.0, you didn't have an easy way to really control when those maintenance tasks would run. And now we have a, a scheduling uh, a mechanism in there, very similar to the backup window, right? So you can literally click on the, the, the blue and gray uh, squares there to decide when uh, VDR should and should not run those maintenance jobs. There's really three uh, that, the, that the tool runs. One is uh, an integrity check, and there's both a full integrity check and, a, and an incremental. Uh, basically, the incremental runs uh, roughly once a day and takes a look at any new backups that have occurred. And then, of course, every seven days, uh, it will go through and do a full integrity check, which just makes sure that, that our restore, the information about restores matches what's actually in, in, that, in that data store there, right? Uh, if for some reason uh, something does not match up, so the integrity check finds some, some challenges or issues with that, it'll do a, a recatalog, right? So that will go in there and that will effectively rebuild uh, that index there. And, and we may have to go in and do a little bit of maintenance on that. I'm not going to get into a ton of detail around that. It's all well documented, but just wanted to make you aware of some of the, the jobs that, that, uh, that happen there. And then, of course, last but not least, that, that second bullet point there, uh, there's a reclaim job. And what that does is, is it takes a look at, at your retention policy. For example, maybe it keeps seven uh, backups, right? So what happens when we hit that eighth, that eighth uh, backup there? Uh, that goes away, that, that oldest one, right? And that's what that reclaim job does there is it understands what, what backups need to fall out of that retention policy, and then we're going to reclaim that space. So when you see the amount of space used in your destination data store, something to keep in mind is it's not going to shrink. So when that reclaim job shrinks, you're not going to see more free space appear in your destination data store, but it does mark those blocks available for reuse. So when the next backup runs, it may not necessarily grow either. So that's what that reclaim job does in there. Okay. Again, I mentioned too that you could suspend tasks. A quick, just a, a quick screenshot on that. The the important note here is that you have if you have a backup that's currently running and you go to suspend that, the the currently running backup job will continue. I talked earlier too about the the efficiency of the the deduplication and compression mechanism in here. Uh, some interesting numbers here. Granted, this is a lab environment. Of course, mileage will vary depending on what you're you're doing and the different types of VMs and data, and whether it's Windows or, or primarily Linux or a mix of both. But uh, what I come up with is again, I had a, a 100 gig. It shows 98.7 on there, right? A little bit of overhead there, but roughly a 100 gig uh, uh, destination data store there. And after backing up a handful of times, I was only taking up about uh, six and a quarter gigabyte, so 6.26 on the screen. But the amount of data that I actually backed up was the equivalent of 276 gig of data. So as you can see, it's very efficient, right? So uh, you, you think you know maybe you have uh, 
VMs that total maybe five, 500 gig or maybe a terabyte in size, you might be pretty darn surprised at, at, at what little space you need to back those virtual machines up into. I've heard nothing but good things uh, in that space there as far as the efficiency. So uh, good stuff, good stuff there. Um, I, I put up there just a quick screenshot. I've had a few questions in the past around, you know, what does that destination uh, data store look like? So if you go through the appliance there, through the command line and open that up, you'll see there are a handful of different files in there, bitmap files, index files, slab files that make up all of that. So, so the question is, can I make any sense of that? Probably not. It's, it's, a, it's a pretty cryptic way that they store that data in there. Uh, but again, just in case you're curious, I, I went ahead and put that up. So the, the good stuff, right? Tips, tricks, and details. Uh, maybe stuff that you won't find in the manual, right? So again, some of this might be 101 stuff, but I think it's important just to, as a reminder to understand what your organization, organization's retention needs are before you start setting these backups, right? We talked about compliance earlier, for example. There might be a requirement to keep copies of data around for maybe seven or 10 years. So you're gonna have to think about that uh, when you're setting up your backups and, and you know, long term, how is this going to look? Uh, again, I mentioned this one as well. Thoroughly review the release notes and documentation. I can't stress that enough because, I, again, I've gotten so many questions and it's like, oh, guys, that's in the release notes. So, and they're, oh, yeah, I see now. So make sure you read that first. Uh, things will go a lot smoother for you. Start with a few virtual machines out of the gate as you're getting familiar with this tool and then grow the environment, right? So establish your best practices as with anything, right? Start small and grow it. Uh, don't try to boil the ocean. And then make sure you test regularly. I mentioned this one as well. Anybody can do backups. It's the pros that can do the restore. So make sure you do those restore rehearsals. Uh, make sure you also keep the plug-in version. So the plug-in for the vSphere client, right? Make sure you keep that at the same version level as your appliance. I know in the past that uh, uh, there, there have been issues around having different versions of those two items there. Uh, so that's something to keep in mind as you upgrade your, your VDR appliance. Make sure you upgrade, upgrade the, the, the client plug-in as well. Uh, also keep in mind that each backup job runs uh, once in a 24-hour period as long as the backup window is open, but as far as getting any more granular than that, it's, it, it really does not, right? So you may have multiple virtual machines that are part of a backup job, and maybe that backup job kicks off at, at 6 o'clock when that, when that backup window opens. Uh, you, know, you never know. That VM might start getting backed up right then, or it might be in the queue 20 or 40 VMs down, right? So we cannot get super granular with, with uh, how that happens. If you need absolute granularity with a couple of VMs, obviously you're going to need to create a separate backup job just for that one or two VMs and then define those, those backup windows accordingly. Uh, just as a footnote, obviously vSphere 5 is, is out, but it has only been out for, for just days, right? So I assume most folks are still on uh, vSphere, some flavor of vSphere 4. Good news is it is supported. So vSphere uh, 4 and vCenter 4 and later are supported. Uh, each vCenter server can support up to 10 appliances. So when you're thinking about scalability, am I limited to just one appliance? And the answer to that is no. You can deploy multiple appliances because each appliance can support up to 100 virtual machines. So if you do some quick math there, you could potentially back up uh, up to 1,000 virtual machines with a single vCenter and 10 of those appliances there. So it will scale pretty good. Um, you know, when you get up in that, in, up in that area, though, it, it might make sense to compare options, right? Because I, I don't necessarily want to position this tool as a completely enterprise-ready uh, backup tool, right? It, it's really generally geared as it stands right now for, for slightly smaller environments, so maybe dozens of VMs, maybe hundreds of VMs. If you have thousands and thousands of VMs, this is probably not the right tool, right? There might be some other things you want to look at out there as far as uh, <coughs> enterprise backup is concerned. But again, my point for many of the environments out there, uh, it will scale uh, for most of those. Uh, VM hardware versions uh, are supported are uh, 4, 7, and 8. Uh, as the slide says, avoid version 4 because change block tracking is not supported. So it will back up those virtual machines, but it will do a full backup each and every time uh, that it backs up that virtual hardware version 4. Hopefully everybody understands what I'm talking about there as far as the, the actual virtual machine hardware that is part of that virtual machine. You can also see that in the GUI there. Uh, in the general uh, section, if you will, it'll show what VM version you're on. Uh, version 7 is with vSphere 4 by default, and then with vSphere 5, uh, we get VM version uh, 8 as it shows up on the screen there. Also keep in mind, too, by default, a maximum of eight virtual machines backed up uh, simultaneously. And by the way, this is a, a slide that I added in because I had uh, several questions in the first couple uh, of sessions here. So you guys are really the first to see this information, even though we've, we've delivered this a few times already. Um, 
there's, there's a couple ways that VDR can do backup, right? So it can do it across the network. So if you have virtual machines that are on local storage, for example, VDR will work with that with no problem. But if you have shared storage, you get a little added benefit here because it will utilize the, the hot add capability uh, within vSphere to, to take a snapshot of that virtual machine and attach that VMDK right to the backup appliance, right, for, for a better performing, more efficient backup. Um, keep in mind that the hot add feature is only part of the Enterprise and Enterprise Plus licensing. So if you're on standard or advanced or whatever the case might be with vSphere 4 or 5, uh, you won't have that option. But VDR, of course, will still work through the traditional network-based uh, backup. Um, if you're backing up eight virtual machines at the same time, and each one of those virtual machines have several VMDK files attached to them, you may potentially run into a limit as far as the number of, of hot add VMDK files we can add to that appliance, right? Uh, by default, it has one, one SCSI device in there, so up to 14 because there's already one disk attached to the system disk there. Uh, but there is a workaround for that. You can simply create a, a dummy disk, if you will, which will turn around and, and add another SCSI adapter in there and then you'll have an additional you know, 14 slots to work with. So if you need to scale that up, there is a workaround. This is in the documentation, so you don't necessarily have to write all this down, but I wanted to highlight that because uh, uh, it's a pretty slick little uh, fix. I, I highly recommend using uh, a VMDK or, or RDM as your destination. I mentioned earlier, SIFs can be, can be dicey. Um, you know, it, it's probably pretty solid for the most part, but if you have the option, uh, I, I would recommend the, the VMDK or RDM. Uh, for again, for stability and, and performance purposes, because we understand that platform a lot better than, than maybe what a third-party SIFS provider could, could give us, right? Uh, also, make sure you back up uh, similar VMs to the same destination data store, and that's pretty easy to figure out because of the deduplication that goes on there, right? The, the more similar the data is, the higher the dedupe rate is going to be, uh, so, so that's a good thing. Also, to note, though, that the VMs don't necessarily have to be part of the same backup job, so you may have multiple jobs, all with all your Windows virtual machines in there, Ddupe is still going to work even across those, those backup jobs. I mentioned this earlier, Ddupe is at the block level, not file. And then last but not least, VSS is supported, as I, as I talked about before. There's some good documentation around specifics, whether it's file level, application level, crash consistent, whatever the case might be, uh, in the VDR administration guide. So make sure you check that out as well. Of course, Microsoft has tons of information around VSS. And I mentioned, too, that I would show you a few screenshots here as evidence that the VSS uh, is working to some degree uh, with VDR. Uh, here is actually my, my vCenter server. So VC2 is getting backed up. You can compare the, the times there in, in the, the VMware uh, data recovery window and, of course, the event viewer there, and, and you'll see that the volume shadow copy service was, was enabled as part of that backup. Uh, toward the bottom is a screenshot from, from an Exchange server. So it shows there that the, the VSS writer was invoked there as well. So the question is, will VSS work with VDR? There's proof in case or proof in point right there that, uh, that it does work. Now notice uh, toward the bottom, though, no log files were truncated for this database. So if you need true, deep, you know, quiescing at the application layer, uh, for some situations it might make sense to use a different tool that has an agent written specifically for that particular application, right? So, so my point being is that VDR will probably address the majority of your backup needs for your virtual machines, but there may be a couple one-off cases where you need uh, a deeper quiescing level for that app, and it might make sense to use a different, uh, a different approach there, perhaps with an agent inside of that VM. So just some food for thought around that. I already talked about the first bullet there, actually the second one as well. So, uh, you know, static IP, uh, make sure when you open a support request with VMware support around VDR, uh, again, 101 stuff, but make sure you include the logs right off the bat. There's a KB article uh, that talks about how to gather those logs. And then, of course, the sooner we can, we can get logs into VMware support's hands, the quicker they can help us to resolution, right? You can also see additional logs in the client by holding down the shift key and then hitting, clicking on the logs there, and, and you'll have the option of seeing uh, three buttons up there now, client log, appliance operations, and appliance asserts. So you get additional logging uh, ability by, by holding down that shift key. Talked about earlier that tape drives are not supported, but, but there is a, an option for, for archiving, right? So maybe you want to archive that off to tape with, a, with another tool, or maybe copy it to a, you know, some, some other type of uh, you know, a, a DR site or whatever the case might be. There are ways to do that. 
Uh, the tool that you use is up to you, but as far as actually grabbing that data, a couple things to keep in mind is, is make sure, first of all, before you copy that destination data store to wherever it's going, um, make sure you unmount that first, just to make sure that that data store is, is fully quiesced, nobody's doing anything in there. Then, of course, at that point, you can copy it to tape or to another site or whatever. And also, as a footnote, and this is not in the documentation, but I, I think it's a good idea to, to save a copy of that ISO that those backups were taken with, right? So if you're using VDR 2.0 to take your backups, uh, do, do, do a copy of that ISO out there once in a blue moon as well, um, because hopefully the developers will continue to, to be backward, backward compatible, right? They'll support, like when we come out with VDR 3.0 or 2.5 or whatever the next release is, we'll be able to go back and, and, and grab restores from 1.x or 2.x or whatever. But just, just in case, just in case, go ahead and copy that ISO over there as well. So that way you can deploy that older version of that VDR appliance, because that OBF is on the ISO file. Key takeaways, we're almost to the end here. Uh, almost time to get that beer, like I mentioned earlier. So uh, we'll go through this pretty quick, right? It's part of the uh, business continuity. It's not the only thing that you need, but it's certainly a key and critical part of that as well. Uh, so make sure that uh, you have some type of backup mechanism in there. VDR is a great choice because it's easy. It's easy to set up. It's easy to deploy. Uh, it's fairly simple. And uh, that, that is, again, the beauty of it. Make sure you, you follow those guidelines that we outlined here. Check that documentation there. Start with just a few VMs. And, uh, and then grow the environment from there, as I mentioned before. Again, the key takeaways here. Um, guys, I appreciate your time today. Hope you enjoyed the session. Hope you got some good information out of it. Uh, questions are certainly welcome. Also, make sure you fill out the, uh, the feedback there, and I'll, and I'll go ahead and start uh, taking any questions, if anybody has any. So I, I saw the gentleman, hang tight right here. I saw the gentleman's hand just go up a split second before yours. You'll need to speak up, please, sir. Is there a, one more time? Uh, there is not a command line interface in the Windows world. It's command line only in Linux and, of course, GUI for Windows. Good question, though. How about up here? I saw your hand as well. So that's an interesting question, right? And we've gotten that in each session. So change block tracking, just to, just to make sure we're clear on all this, happens at the source, right? So that's tracked at the VM level. But as far as deduplication, that happens at the destination. Does that make sense? What's that again? No, it's not a separate job that runs after the fact and goes back and deduplicates it. It happens on the fly. So it's in line, in other words. Okay. Yes, sir. It's not to, to suspend and resume a currently running job. It's only for future jobs. Yes, sir. Correct. Well, so automatically, I, I take that back. If you want to do manual backups, you can do that more often, right? Remember I showed you the one screenshot there? So the question was, can I back up more often than once in a 24-hour period? Automatically, you can't, but you can certainly run multiple manual jobs, right? Right-click and back up all sources, and that'll, that'll work. So up to two terabytes, but that would be split across two destinations. Your destination data store should be a maximum of one terabyte in size, but you can have two of those per, uh, per appliance. Yes, correct. I think I saw a hand way back, back in here. No, maybe not. Oh, maybe it was over here. Go ahead, sir. Uh, there's no reason you couldn't do that. I, I, I have not actually tested that, to be honest with you. So the question was, can I, can I have like two individual backup jobs targeting the same virtual machine on different, uh, you know, retention policies, if you will? And, uh, you know, that's, that's a great question. That's one uh, use case I have not tested, but just kind of thinking and shooting from the hip, I don't see why you could not do that. Yeah, once again, uh, same appliance or different appliance. Not sure on that. The only thing you would want to watch out for is if those jobs run at the same time. Because keep in mind, when a backup job kicks off to back up that virtual machine, there is a command issued to snapshot that virtual machine, right? So if you've got two things trying to snapshot that VM at the same time, uh, you could run into some pretty serious issues there. 
So that'd be the one big caveat that I'd be real worried about. So just make sure if you're going to try something like that, uh, that one backup window doesn't overlap the other. Over here, yes, sir. Uh, so same thing as 1.0. So the question was, do, do multiple backup appliances have the ability to share information across the same destination data store or across each other regardless of destination data stores, correct? Um, that's correct. So I, I guess the easy answer that any way, shape, or form, there's no sharing that goes on there. So there, there's no knowledge, in other words, of, of one appliance of what the other one's backing up, which is what it would enable the scenario he's talking about to potentially target two VMs. But again, that, that could lead to mixed results. Yes, sir. It does. It does, yes. Depending on the version of vSphere that you're running, it may show as out of date. Uh, I would not recommend up. So the question was, does the VDR appliance have VMware tools pre-installed in that? The answer is yes, it does. Uh, but it may show up as out of date on there. It is not recommended to update the tools. Leave that up to us as we uh, release new VDR appliances. So even though it's out of date, just leave it that way. Yeah, yeah. I haven't tried it, but I don't see why not. Yes, over here. Yeah, um, is there an option, uh, to, for instance, if I'm trying to uh, take a snapshot of the VM and I'm unable to do that for whatever reason, if I'm running a uh, software as the initiator, uh, is there an option to take a, a non quiz backup in this product or not? Um, not that I'm aware of. I don't want to answer that with 100% certainty, but I don't think that there is. I think you'll run into issues if you're not able to snapshot that VM because that's part of the normal workflow of that backup. So you may have to look to, uh, to other options there. So it sounds like uh, VMware support has a workaround for that, correct? Good to know. Thank you. Any, uh, so hold on one second there. I know this. I think this gentleman's been waiting in the back here. I'll be right back with you. Yes, sir. Go ahead in the back, please. What about uh, roadmaps to the future? Do you uh, envision support for actively running VMs from a backup while you restore to the production environment? Um, I don't know necessarily that that will happen. Um, I haven't heard. I guess conversation around that either way. I'm not saying that it won't, uh, but that's great feedback. That sounds like something that maybe you could use in your environment that we should consider. Is that what I'm hearing? Absolutely. Okay, very good. Gotcha. Good to know. Thank you for that. Go ahead up here, sir. Uh, not for each cluster, but for vCenter you do. So the VDR appliances are tied to vCenter, and whatever is managed by that vCenter is what VDR will have visibility to. Do we, did I see a hand up? Yes, sir. What's that again, please? Uh, I'm not sure if it'll be in Partner Central. So the question was, will this presentation be available after the fact? And the answer is yes, it will. Uh, I'm not sure if it'll be in Partner Central or not. I, I will try to make it, uh, to remember to put it there, but it will definitely be up on VMworld.com for sure. So you'll have access to it that way. Uh, I'm going to try to put it on Partner Central as well. Any other questions, comments? Another one in here? Hi, it's a lot of I.O. in the uh, machine, right? Uh, improvements have been made. Has it been solved completely? I don't think so. So you, you should see better. I, in other words, what I'm saying is if, even if you had issue with that particular v, uh, VM with 1.2, try it again with 2.0. And it's not just a VMware uh, VDR it thing, but it also has to do with tools and, and vSphere itself, right? And I, I ran into that same thing, actually. And as a matter of fact, it was my vCenter uh, virtual machine because I had my database local to that VM. And I ran into that, that exact issue with uh, VDR 1.2 with 2.0 works like a charm. Another question back here? Um, I think you can by default. Go ahead. 
Are you going to say something more? Yeah, I was going to say, I don't think you can specify, though, a specific, ne you know what I mean, a specific network there to do that. Yeah, it's just not that robust yet. So uh, another question just behind him? Was there one back there as well? No, nope, maybe not. Anyone else? One more? You're almost out of questions, sir. <laughs> I'm kidding. <laughs> Well, not off of tape, right? We absolutely cannot do restores from tape. It would be a two-step process. So you would restore the destination data store from tape, right? And then you would turn around and mount that destination data store with the VDR appliance and then restore the virtual machine. But that's my question is how, okay, so I understand that I mount the, the destination data store. Now, how do I get that to tape? Well, that, that would be with some other solution, right? Because, again, VDR does not, does not utilize tape. So if you have an existing tape backup solution of some sort, that could be a possible target. Maybe it's just a, a simple X copy to a, to a recovery site or whatever the case might be. So I'm actually talking about the VMDK file, right? So when we have a destination data store, it's a VMDK file in most cases, or it could be a SIF share. But either way, that volume, if you will, you just you grab that whole chunk, right? You take that whole VMDK file and either archive it to, to tape if you have a mechanism for that, or copy it to another site or another host or whatever the case might be. Does that make sense? It's too simple, I know. <laughs> Again, that's what I like about it. Are we good? Any other questions? All right, guys. Oh, wait, I'm sorry. One more back here. So, every, so the question was, if I lose the VDR appliance, can I just simply put a new one in place, attach it to the original destination data store, and will it just work? The answer to that is yes, it will. Everything you need from configuration all the way to the data itself is all contained in that destination data store. So if that appliance goes south on you, just put a new appliance out there, attach it, and, and start back up where you left off. Good question. Oh, one more. Go ahead. Uh, you could potentially do it across the WAN. I'm not sure I would encourage that. Um, depends on your bandwidth, right, latency, all those types of things. As I mentioned, we've, we've improved the resiliency to network hiccups in there. Uh, but, but again, if your target, your destination data store uh, is up and down a little bit because of a, of a flaky WAN link, uh, you, you may run into some serious issues with that. I think we're good. Thanks again, everybody.